let's carry on the go, go back to the science. Now, the interesting thing in physics is when the theory falls apart. What happens when it doesn't work? That's what experimentalists always want. Proving a theory works is boring. But if you can take something that is on the pedestal and knock it off, ah, that's the, that is where careers are made. So we look at this and say, well, what happens when we think we have a symmetry and then we plug it in, principle of least action, apply the symmetry, turn the mathematical crank through Noether's theorem, and we get a result, something that ought to be a law of nature if that symmetry is truly symmetric. The principle of least action is built on a pretty strong foundation. Noether's theorem is simply mathematics, right? So you can prove it. It's mathematics. Let's prove it. There's nothing really to question there. So what you would question is the symmetry at the other end, your hypothesis. So what do you do? Well, of course, I have another box, this one considerably more expensive than the mathematics, the experimental green box. So what do you do? You do some experiments and you find out, do the predictions. Or is that law of nature, does it hold up to experimental scrutiny? If not, then it's what you call a broken symmetry. And broken symmetries then beg a lot of questions. What is their ultimate impact on the nature of matter? So, here are some interesting symmetries. They look at first glance. Some of them look at first glance as if they ought to obviously hold. For example, parity. Parity is this left-right left, switch. When you look in a mirror, Remember, when, I, when we did time translation, if I do an experiment now, I will get the same result as if I do that same experiment now. It's time translation. Now, parity, the switching of left-right, means if I do an experiment here, do I get the same result as if I do that experiment and rather than watch the experiment in, well, rather than take the data from the actual experiment, if I take the data from the mirror image, do I get the same results? Seems like you probably would, doesn't it? Well, you almost always do. So it's kind of obvious symmetry. Now here's, here's another symmetry, time reversal. If instead of going forward in time, if I go backward, will things look the same? Well, it really doesn't seem like it, because my hair's not getting any less gray, right? Time has an arrow. So this looks to me like a completely obviously broken symmetry. But if you look at the laws of nature, you know, the trajectory of a particle, um, the evolution of simple systems, not big statistical sy systems, but systems where you can track every piece. The equations are symmetric under time translation. So at the fundamental level, there's this problem that time translation looks mathematically like it ought to be a symmetry, though it clearly violates something. In fact, it violates the third law of thermodynamics. Entropy increases. So there's something funny there. Now here's another one that's somewhat more esoteric that we need to string all this together, and that's called charge conjugation. Now what charge conjugation is that we switch all of the charges of matter the opposite way. So for example, we take an electron, turn it into a positron. We make it from negative to positive. We just switch the charges of everything. A proton becomes an antiproton. Now, charge conjugation amounts to switching matter and antimatter. Now, since antimatter is defined to be the equal of matter except for this change, then in a universe full of antimatter, we would certainly expect the laws of nature to be the same. 
Everything would look the same and just have flip charges. Instead of having electrons flowing through motherboards, you'd have positrons, big deal. Okay. But there's something funny there too, right? Because this is an annoying problem, is that in every case where matter is created from energy, there are always equal amounts of matter and antimatter. So how come this universe has almost all matter and almost no antimatter? There's a huge broken symmetry. So one of the experiments that's been going well, various experiments that have been carried out since the mid 60s have been trying to figure out where's this broken symmetry? So let's have a quick look at that. Um, first, we switch the direction of time and we do the left-right switch and we switch all these charges. We, we apply all three of these apparent symmetries at once and lo and behold, the product of them all seems to hold. It seems to hold, okay? It holds in every case. But if we reduce that, if we remove the switching of forward and past, if we remove the time translation symmetry, then, and we apply just this left-right, the parity, and the matter-antimatter switching of charge, then there's a broken symmetry. There are just a tiny handful of processes involving these esoteric particles, kaons and, and B mesons, things that we just don't bump into every day. And there's this little itty bitty asymmetry there where there's a tiny, tiny bit more matter than there is antimatter. That gives us two things. First, it gives us a hint as to why there's more matter than antimatter in the universe. But more interesting than that is that if CP, if the product of C and P is broken, but the product of CP and T is not broken, then that means that somewhere along the line that time reversal is broken too. So we can all breathe a sigh of relief because the third law of thermodynamics is then allowed to continue because there is a broken symmetry. Don't know what it is, trying to figure it out. So finally, the standard model has a problem. The standard model is this, is this great big theory which is built on, a, on way too many experimental details. It involves nature at its most fundamental level. All of the matter that we're aware of, that we can easily observe, is made up of these things, quarks and leptons, and force fields that are given there um, on the side, photons, gluons, Zs, Ws, and I drew in the big G for graviton. You don't need to know what any of those are to realize that this standard model of physics, it'd be perfectly happy if none of these things had any mass at all. But once again, we have a great deal of empirical evidence that we have mass. And in many cases, our mass is increasing as we eat more. There's mass. Where did it come from? How did it happen? In fact, if we do a rotation among all these particles, just switch their names and leave the masses out, none of the laws of physics change. Okay? There is a problem. This is the origin of mass problem. And this guy here, Peter Higgs at Edinburgh University, he formulated a theory about, and to say he formulated the theory is really giving him more credit than he deserves, but there is a lot of theory behind broken symmetries. And he used that to, to hypothesize a particle which appears when the symmetry is broken in a certain way, and he called it the Higgs boson.